Okay, well, welcome everybody. My name is Desiree D'Souza and I'm the Exec Director of Innovation and Impact at Social at Seeability. Welcome everyone. It's really a pleasure to have you all with us today. Um, so this is the first in our series of In the Lounge With and we're really excited to have you all join us in what would have been uh, the Tokyo Paralympics 2020. We hope it's the first of many insightful and inspiration sessions. And as I said, we're just excited that we could all join together and, and, and celebrate this moment. So before I go on to introduce you to our wonderful speakers today, um, I just want to tell you a little bit more about Seeability um, and the work that we do. So we're absolutely here today because we believe in rethinking disability. And we're here because we want to showcase stories of inclusion at its best. Um, as we've already alluded to, we're celebrating inclusion during a time that would have been the Tokyo Paralympics. But why does inclusion matter and what role does Seeability have to play in it? Well, for more than 220 years, Seeability has provided ambitious support for people with sight loss, learning disabilities and autism. We encourage people to challenge what they expect from life, from themselves and from wider society. And that's why we at Seeability have made a commitment to demonstrate what inclusive communities could look like and to create real opportunities for everyone to have the chance to live, love, thrive and belong as equal citizens. It's really at the heart of everything that we do. So we're delighted to bring this virtual event to you today, free of charge. But as you know, we're a charity and we rely on the generosity of our supporters to help us achieve our ambitions and to help the people that we support out there. So all that we ask that if you're able to and you would like to, that you consider making a donation to us this, this afternoon. And if you'd like to do that, there's a couple of ways. Later on in the um, event, we'll be posting our donation page. So please take a look at that, uh, keep a look out for that in the chat function at the side of your screen. Or else if you'd like our, uh, our website um, uh, address, it's www.seeability.org and you do forward slash to donate. Thank you so much. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to all three of our wonderful guest speakers today. We have Deborah Hale, MBE. Um, Deborah is our, C is our trustee at Seeability. And she'll be talking about producing the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic torch relay. And you're absolutely in for a treat to hear her story this evening. We're also joined by Olivia Breen, a double Paralympian and the current T38 long jump IPC world champion. Mm -hmm. Lovely to have you here, Olivia. Mm -hmm. And Millie Knight, a Paralympic medalist and racer ready 2020 um, Parasport Athlete of the Year. So excited to have you, Millie, as well. Um, once you've heard from all our speakers, they've all, um, they're all open to, to hearing your questions uh, and taking those questions. So what I would say is, don't wait. As you hear them speak, if you're interested or you want to know more, please just type your questions into the, um, the chat function at the side and we'll be collecting them as we go to share with our panelists at the end. Um, before I hand over to our panel, I just have a couple of um, housekeeping uh, points to raise. So we ask that um, everyone, unless you're speaking, keep your um, mics on mute, please. That would be great. Um, if you're an attendee today, please switch to speaker view, um, which should be on the top right hand of your screen so that you can see the main speaker while they're talking. And if you'd like a question, as I said, don't have to wait to the end. Just type it into the chat function. It won't interrupt anyone. And we'll be collecting those questions to share with the panel as we go along. So without further ado, um, I'm delighted to hand over to our first speaker, Deborah Hale, as I said, MBE. Deborah is our trustee at Seeability and much of Deborah's career has been in marketing and communications and major events in both the UK and internationally. Today, Deborah joins us to share her experience in producing the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic torch relays for which she received her MBE. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Desiree, and, and thank you very much for inviting me um, to share the panel with such uh, incredible people. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, honoured. Um, I would uh, very much like to talk about both uh, the Olympic torch relay, but, but I'd like to focus um, as well on the Paralympic torch relay and perhaps tell a few stories that are less well known. Um, 
both relays obviously come before the games themselves and they provide an opportunity to showcase uh, the UK and for 2012 we we looked not only at our amazing landscape uh, and landmarks but we also saw it as an opportunity to showcase uh, individuals communities on both a national and a regional basis um, and really individuals we were very keen that and in both relays i, I am correct in saying that over 90 percent of those who ran with the flames were members of the public they were what we called extraordinary ordinary people who ran in the place that they came for from um, and in that respect we learned a great deal um, about community and how how important community is and we're seeing that now more than ever at this time but how people want to celebrate those from the place that they are uh, that, that, that they come from um, so we went through a nomination process and selected these extraordinary, ordinary people uh, and it gave us the most wonderful opportunity to tell their stories and this for the Paralympic Torch Relay began right at the beginning uh, and we selected uh, four groups of people, young people from very, very different, with very, very different abilities um, from the scouting and the guiding community. And those four groups on the same day, starting at the same time, ascended each of the four peaks. So um, Snowdon uh, in Wales, Ben Nevis in Scotland, Scarfell Pike in England, and Sleeve Donard in Northern Ireland. And when they got to the top of each of the four peaks, using that age old method of wood and flint, they created a flame. And they brought that flame back to the capital of each of the countries and did a little tour around each of the capitals and then brought those flames, those four flames, back to Stoke Mandeville, which is the home of the Paralympic movement. And those four flames were united to create the Paralympic flame. Um, and one of the things I love about that story is that there was no protocol for the Paralympic torch relay prior to this point. And it was very important to, to the team at 2012 that we created such a protocol. Um, and now, before every single Paralympic torch relay, um, it will begin at Stoke Mandeville. So whether it was Rio or Sochi or in, when, it, when Japan's time comes, Tokyo's time comes, it will, that flame will always start from its home in Stoke Mandeville. So that's something that we were very, very proud of. And from that point, uh, from Stoke Mandeville, we then completed a 24 through the middle of the night our relay where teams of five, it's very different to the Olympic torch relay, but where teams of five individuals passed the flame from one to another and then on to the next team until finally it reached um, the opening ceremony and lit the cauldron to mark the official opening of the games. And both relays were extraordinary in many, many different ways. But when I reflect back on um, on the Paralympic torch relay and, and Stoke Mandeville and the experiences that I had there, I found that it was an extraordinary lesson in, in storytelling and the power of community and really the power of human potential and what is possible rather than what is not. And it was so pleasing on, on both relays. We had people of all sorts of different abilities with all sorts of stories to tell. But what was so exciting was the public really wanted to hear those stories. They really wanted to celebrate them. There was a, a bit of a tussle with the BBC at one point where one of the executives had said, you know, the public won't come out for the public, but they did. Uh, and I think in total, certainly for the Olympic torch relay, something like 16 million people um, came out uh, to watch, which was absolutely crazy. Um, but I think that it is this power of what is possible. I've been thinking about that a lot during this very strange new, new time. Um, and I think that's something really to hold on to. We're very... Um, averse to change aren't we as human beings but when change is forced upon us we rise to the challenge um, and I, I suppose 
in terms of my sort of contribution to this session, that was that was really the thought that I wanted to leave people with this this notion that we have extraordinary human potential and we should focus on what is possible um, and all the good and the excitement and the joy that that can come as a result of that. Incredible, incredible. I mean, I don't know how many people are aware that Deborah, you and your team were part of the origin story of, you know, the, the Paralympic um, flame and the ceremony. I just think it's, it gives me goosebumps to hear it. Um, and thank you for reminding us that, you know, although we're here today to talk about the Paralympics and, and, and uh, uh, you know, the contribution of para athletes, I mean, but there, there's something that we're all going through at the moment around sort of all, all being individuals and, and our kind of our collective contribution and thinking about our potential and the role we can play. It's just wonderful. And, and I'm sure that some of our, our attendees today will, will probably want to hear more of those stories later on. So thank They're you for sharing. Thank you for teasing us with those. <laughs> okay. Come back to you in a bit. Wonderful. Thanks again. Um, so now over to Olivia. Now, um, Olivia, Livy uh, competed um, for Team GB at the London and Rio Paralympic Games and you won a bronze medal in the 4x100 relay in London. In 2017 she became the T38 world long jump champion and in 2018 the T38 Commonwealth long jump champion. We are incredibly honoured to have you here today Livy. Um, please tell us a little bit more about your journey. We're really excited to, to hear more from you. Just need you to unmute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no problem. We will. We'll <laughs> so we can't hear you at the moment, Livy. We just need um, your your mic to be unmuted, and it's at the bottom left hand corner of your screen. I don't know if we can do that from our side. I think we might need, ah, oh. okay. Now, Olivia's frozen for a moment, so she may have to, to log back on. Um, Millie, I hope it's all right if we come over to you then. Um, so, and then we'll come back, we'll pick up with Livy um, after that. So, Millie, um, uh, sorry, just a second here. Great. So, Millie, you also competed in two Paralympic Games, becoming bronze medalists in three disciplines. Um, in 20, oh, now we have Olivia back. Now, Olivia, are you all right? Can you hear us? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Millie was just about to, to stand in there. <laughs> okay. So, Millie, if you don't mind holding on for a couple of minutes. Sorry, we'll, we'll... <laughs> no worries. Okay, you okay? You ready? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Wonderful. Let me hand over to Livy then. <laughs> um, so, hello guys. Sorry for that in the distraction. Uh, my name's Olivia Breen. I'm a T38 long jumper and sprinter. I, I've been in T38 a bit, a bit in a minute. I'm 24 years old from Surrey. Trained in Loughborough, but yeah, I'll tell you about my life in a minute. Um, so, I was born six weeks early. Um, <laughs> Got, I was very, very premature, you know, and stuff. And then uh, when I was, I have a twin brother as well. So um, my, my parents were like watching him and me and comparing us, you know, and I wasn't really doing much, as much as what he was doing. So um, yeah, and then I, when I was two years old, I got diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Um, I got like, I made diagnosed when I was four years, four years old as well. So they, when I was four years old, they told me I couldn't do, they couldn't do more, more for me. And my dad was like, well, I can't do this great Ormond Street, and I like, she wouldn't make it in the ambulance and stuff. So, um, yeah, it was quite terrifying for my parents. Obviously, I don't remember, because I was like a very tiny baby. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then um, I was, got diagnosed with hearing impairment when I was four as well, so I'm deaf and got cerebral palsy, and got some learning difficulties at school. Um, and then um, I, got, when I, I won my first sports day when I was five years old at school. And my parents are like, oh my God, like, she's, they didn't really know where my life was going. They didn't really 
they, know, they never experienced it as to have a disabled child, you know. And then um, they, they told me to run the race. I'm like, oh my God, she's winning. Like, oh my God. So that was really, that was really a really nice moment for them. And then I did like try loads of other sports, you know, like, um, um, like horse riding, trampolining, uh, loads of other sports as well. And running was my thing. I joined City of Portland Athletics Club when I was 13 years old. Just love being like with my friends and social, you know, just being in the back of the field. And then, um, so I got invited to the England Talent Day when I was 15 years old. And I was just like, no, I don't want to go. Like, I love being with my friends because my parents always treat me as the same as my brothers. So, um, and my twin brother as well, he hasn't got a disability. So, yeah. And then um, I joined, I went to the Talent Day. My hands like, you should go, it'll be really good. And I was like, yeah, okay, why not? So I went and I saw someone the same disability. And I thought, oh my God, someone's got cerebral palsy. Like, I never, because I also went to a mainstream school, like I went to a special needs school and I was like four to five, but I didn't, didn't really remember it very well. And then um, when I went to a mainstream, like, you know, and I went to a mainstream school, you know, didn't really experience the disability kind of thing. And then um, it was really nice to see and I had the best day. And then I got classified as a, a disabled athlete. Like in, in Paralympic school, you do that classification. I didn't know if you guys, obviously Millie knows about it and Devin knows about it, but, um, yeah, and then um, I got so got classified as a T38, so T stands for track, and 38 is the mildest class in several palsy in athletics. And um, didn't really know where my life was going, like, you know, ran a race in Kingston in 2012 and like number one in the UK in the T38 category. And I was just like, okay, like, this is crazy, like, okay, this is great. And then I got international, GB got in touch with me, like, we wanted to get internationally classified to run internationally. And I was like, okay, like, to so into Croatia, ran against the number one in the world, the Russian. It was just unbelievable, you know, I didn't really think anything of it. And then, um, like, that was in May. And then in June, I got invited to go to the European Championships in Holland. And that was amazing. I got two bronze medals in 100 meters and 200 meters, which was really exciting. And then the 9th of July came and I got selected for the Paralympic Games and it was just, London 2012 was incredible. It was like, you guys remember, and Deb was a big part of it, the torch, and it was an incredible game, the home games. I was second youngest member of the team. Yeah, it was a complete roller coaster, but amazing. Like, I've never changed my life for it. You know, sport has just changed my life completely. Like, it's given me so much confidence, independence, you know, and self-belief as well, you know. And then um, I got given, so carried on training and getting ready. And then I got given a Sky Scholarship in 2013. So I was about to go to college um, down the road from me, like got him in. And um, Sky were like, no, Libby, we want you to become a better athlete. So I was like, okay, like, what does that involve? Like, obviously I want to get better, but like, what does that involve me doing? And they wanted me to move to a new coach in North London. So that made me leaving home and going to a sixth form college in North London, leaving all my friends and family behind. And I just thought, you know what, like, I've got nothing to lose. If I hate it, I can move back. If I love it, then great. And I loved it. Best experience, like, I've made friends for life, you know, like, coach was great. And then got ready to get ready for Rio and stuff, you know. And then obviously went to the Commonwealth Games and tried for the long jump in 2014, because there was no sprints for me in the Commonwealth Games. So I thought, let's try long jump, you know. Again, you never know. And I was good at it, so I was like, yay. And then, um, yeah, it was really good. And then when I was, went to Rio, didn't go to plan. Like, I came, so in 20, Rio 26, in 2012, I came fifth in the 100 meters, eighth in the 200 meter final, and got a bronze medal in the relay, which was really exciting. Being part of the relay team as well was amazing. But then Rio came, I came seventh in the 100 meter final, 12th in the long jump, got told an hour before I wasn't in the relay team. It was a disaster, like, it was heartbreaking. Like, I didn't really know what to do with myself, you know, like, from having such a good game, the pilot game in 2012, like 2012, and then going to the, you know, sad bit to Rio, you know, but like, you just got to dig deep in sport. Like, it's up and down, like, it's love and hate kind of relationship. And when everything's going great, it's like, is everything okay? Like, why is everything going so well, you know? And then after Rio, I decided to move to Loughborough. So to be with a jump coach, who's a great coach called Aston Moore, great best coach, you know, really. And, and um, 
I became, after coming 12 from Rio, moving to a new coach, I became world champion in 2017 in the long jump. It's just amazing, like, what difference. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Yay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Like, what a difference, like, a different coach can do and, like, what you can do to yourself, you know, because you never know unless you try. And, um, yeah, and that was amazing. And then the following year after the Commonwealth Games, after the World Championship, I became Commonwealth champion as well. And it was just, like, this progress, you know, and everything. And I got a bronze medal in the 100 metres as well in the Commonwealth Games as well. So it's coming home with a few medals was amazing. And then, obviously, last year I came and got a bronze medal in the World Championships in the long jump as well. And then, obviously, this year was meant to be the Paralympics, but it's been cancelled to next year. But um, lockdown has been okay for me because um, I moved back home to be with my family and I've got a track five minutes away from my house, which is outdoors and so no one's there. And then um, we've got a gym and we've got a, some gym equipment in our garage. So I've actually been okay. I'm on a little break now and then I'm moving back to Loughborough next week. So that's my story, guys. I hope you all enjoyed it. And yeah, I'll have some other questions. Yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Oh, Libby, that was amazing. Wow. Oh, I, I'd love that to be my story to get an Olympic <laughs> medal. Wow. I think it was wonderful to hear how much sport has given you. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sure people will, will probably want to reflect on that more. But, you know, you talk about the kind of independence it gives you, but it sounds like also that sense of continually believing in yourself. You know, there were, there were times when it sounds like it was it wasn't going your way to just tell us a bit more about how you you, you continue to believe in yourself and push for you know the, the heights that you've been able to get to yeah so I saw myself in Rio like I saw like I thought I had so much more potential and I wanted to come and get come home with a medal but obviously like that didn't happen I just thought you know what no I'm not giving up I've still got more in me I'm young like I was 19 at the time so I just thought you know I'm young I've got so much more to give so like let's see what else I can give and it was the best decision I've ever made like going to a new coach in Loughborough and moving away further away from home but like moving to London was a good stepping forward like being that far away from home and then moving even further like you know it was a good stepping stone but like I'm so glad I did it because I wouldn't be where I am today. Kind of thing. Wonderful if you could bottle it and share it with all of us we'd, we'd yeah. love we'd love some. <laughs> Brilliant thank you so much Livy. Um, so as I said you know if you've got questions for Livy, how she did it how she rose to um, uh, you know through her ranks so quickly then please um, pop those in the in the chat box um, at the side of your screen. Wonderful thanks Livy. we'll come back to you in a bit. <laughs> Lovely. So um, let's uh, let's introduce you to Millie. Millie as I was saying earlier has competed in two Paralympic Games, becoming bronze medalist in three disciplines in the 2080 Paralympics in Pyeongchang. We're really honored to have um, um, Millie with us today. So Millie, if I can hand over to you to tell us a bit more of your story, that would be wonderful. Awesome, um, hopefully I'm now unmuted. Um, if you can hear me, that's, that's brilliant. Um, I have my dog in the room, so if you hear barking, it's, it's, it's my dog, <laughs> sorry. Um, so uh, yeah, my name is Millie Knight. Um, and uh, I, I'm a three-time Paralympic medalist um, and I am visually impaired. So I lost my sight when I was six um, and it was actually at the same time that my mum decided that actually the best way to cope with this would be to take me skiing, um, which I guess is everybody's sort of approach to your child mm -hmm. losing their sight. Um, and uh, I... I loved it. It was, it was insane. And, um, especially because at the time that this was all happening, I was at school, I was at just a normal mainstream school. Um, I mean, it was, it was pretty special, but it, it was, you know, um, and, uh, I was sort of participating in, in all the sports, um, bless them. Um, they, they put me in, in goal for hockey, um, a goal shooter for netball. Um, and, uh, you know, cross country, I'd run, run into trees and, you know, sport was really not my thing. And it, yeah, I, I wasn't particularly academic at the time either. And so when I went skiing, it was absolutely insane because all of a sudden I'd gone from this kid who was always last to be picked for any sports team, um, was the reason that we lost hockey games um was the worst at maths and all of a sudden I was overtaking my friends on the slopes 
um, I was going faster than everybody else. And it was something that I was able to control um, and that I'd kind of found that made me happy. Um, and from that point onwards, you know, my, my family um, uh, went every, every year, um, went as, as much as possible and as much as I made them go. <laughs> um, and it, it just became, it became an obsession really. Um, and we went year after year after year um, until 2012. So this was quite a turning point for me in my life. Um, it was my first exposure to the Paralympic Games. Um, and I live in Canterbury and Kent, so we're super close to London. So we literally went up to every event that we possibly could. Um, we went to the Olympics, we saw the um, show jumping, the dressage, all sorts of things. Um, and then we went to the opening ceremony of the Paralympic Games. Oh my days. <laughs> that was just, it, it, I, can't, I can't even describe how amazing that felt. I, we were sat in the gods, we were, we were miles away from all the action, and yet it felt the atmosphere was electric. Um, and I remember thinking, this is beyond anything that I could have even dreamt of. Um, I'm watching these amazingly talented athletes from all around the world right in front of me, carrying their flags and representing their country. This is something that I totally want to do. Um, and um, with, with that drive, I, I made it happen. And um, on the 15th of January, um, 2014, yeah, um, I had, uh, <laughs> it was actually my birthday, yeah. Um, but before then, I was told that I was on the long list for Sochi 2014. But I was also told to limit my expectations because there would be no way that I'd be going to the games. No chance at all. In fact, the only reason that I'd be going to the games would be if somebody died. Um, so that so that was, you know, little 14 year old me kind of was like, OK, that's nice. Thanks for considering me. But uh, yeah. Um, and then on the 15th of January, um, uh, I got a phone call just after I'd come out of a geography class at school. Um, saying, oh, happy birthday, Millie. Um, congratulations, you've been picked for uh, the British team for Sochi 2014, um, which came with a mixed sort of bag of emotions um, because initially it was kind of like, oh, who's died? Um, but uh, luckily no one had, and I'd actually qualified in my own right um, through the various Europa Cups races. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the really cool thing is that the cutoff age for um, competing in Sochi was the 15th of January 1999, um, which was my birthday. So I, I was the youngest person in the whole of Great Britain to um, uh, compete at, at those Paralympic Games. Um, and I went on to come fifth in both my events, uh, which was which was really awesome um, because I'd, I'd kind of gone in thinking, just please don't come last. Um, and but the, the the coolest thing that just is still a career highlight for me um is i was picked to carry the flag at the opening ceremony so my little dream of when when i was sat at the opening ceremony in 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 Lon london um came true in russia and uh walking out carrying the flag in in a stadium full of fifty five thousand people um is is really like no other feeling um and uh yeah i i kind of went went from strength to strength F from that point onwards i um went to compete at the world championships in canada the following year um we won a silver and a bronze oh it feels like such a long time ago now uh, a silver and a bronze and then we went on to compete at World Cup races, um, winning a few medals. And in skiing, there's a, a award called the Crystal Globe, which is um, a trophy that you get at the end of a season if you've won the most um, World Cup races. And um, since then, we have won that three times. Um, I keep mentioning we but because uh, obviously, like I said, I'm visually impaired, so I have to ski with my guide. My guide is currently Brett Wilde and hopefully will be for the foreseeable future. Um, he's a Royal Navy submariner and uh, he skis two, three metres in front of me. 
we communicate through Bluetooth headsets and our helmets and um, we communicate all the way down the mountain. So he'll say things like um, what the terrain is doing, what the course is like um, and yeah, literally anything else that he thinks is important for me to hear. Um, most of the time you'll just hear Brett screaming at me. Um, <laughs> and then I'll say back to him whether I can still see him, whether I can't, whether we need to speed up, slow down, um, whether our distance is too great, too small. And basically all of that forwards and back communication happens in a fraction of a second. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and then there's sort of loads of things that um, I can pick up from the sound of his skis so I can tell whether it's icy, whether it's slushy, whether there's a lot of snow. Um, so it's kind of like the little bits of um, silent information is what we call it that I pick up on. Um, so yes, my guy Brett, so Brett and I, <laughs> we are we're, we're a team, we were medals together, um, everything happens, you know, with, with us as a team. Um, and then in 2017, we uh, competed at our second World Championships and uh, we won a gold. So we became GB's first ever snow sports world champions. Um, so in any snow sport discipline, um, which was, uh, I think, amazing. I can't tell you if it was or not because I crashed. <laughs> so I came through the finish line um, at 115 kilometers an hour and failed to stop, um, which was the first of many major crashes during that season, uh, uh, sadly. Um, and uh, yeah, a couple of weeks later, we flew out to South Korea um, for the Paralympic test events of Pyeongchang. Um, and I came through the finish line, failed to stop again. You, note to self, you can't stop in one turn when you're traveling at that speed. Um, and you'd have thought I'd have learned from the first time. Um, but I didn't, this time didn't land so well, flipped three times, landed on my head each time, finally dislocated my jaw and being blue lighted off to hospital. Um, I sustained a seriously severe concussion that took six months for me to be able to even fully function as a human. Um, and as you can probably imagine, that was not the most ideal timing, considering I wanted to win five gold medals at the Paralympic Games six months after that. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that was the worst time of my life. I'd rather lose more sight than have concussion again. Because um, quite frankly, having poor sight is the best thing in the world. Um, I literally, I would not change it for anything. People, people often ask, um, you know, if you could have your sight back tomorrow, would you? Um, absolutely not. My life is far, far greater with the opportunities and experiences that I've gained through having slightly rubbish sight. Um, and uh, I'm I'm so so grateful for that. Um, I mean, really, like you get to skip the queue at Thought Park. <laughs> I mean, there there are some serious serious benefits of being disabled. Um, and yeah, I mean. Uh, being able to compete at a Paralympic Games is, is something that is the ultimate um, for, for most people and especially for me. And where we'd come from having had the concussion um, was a really difficult place. Um, I lost all my confidence, everything. It was just fairly horrendous, to be honest. Um, and uh, I was obviously very ill. <laughs> um, but when we came through the finish line, um of of the Paralympic Games it was a, a weird sort of feelings again because obviously the the last time that I crossed that finish line I was blue lighted to hospital um so knowing that and also trying to perform at my best was a really difficult thing that required a lot of psychological strength I guess um and then when we came through the finish line and we'd won a silver medal it was unreal absolutely it felt like a gold to us um and then on day two um we won another silver medal um and it was like oh <laughs> it wasn't just a fluke it was you know we've actually achieved these results um it's not just like everyone was out everyone else was skiing badly we actually managed to achieve those results by ourselves and it was just amazing i mean the next day we came fourth um, <laughs> um, which, which is really tough. Um, not as tough as coming seventh, um, which we came the next day. Um, and then on our last day of com competition, uh, it was slalom. So our weakest event and we just kind of thought, uh, 
we're not going to do very well, <laughs> you know, let's just get home. <laughs> so we, we kind of just, kind of, we just didn't sort of put as much psychological effort into that race. I think we just relaxed a little bit more and actually we won a bronze medal. <laughs> um, so I think that's a, a technique to learn, just chill out a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, so to come away from the games, having previously been in a hospital bed, not being able to function to three Paralympic medals um, was just something that, yeah, I could never have even imagined. Um, and uh, yeah, here we are, only 555 days till uh, Beijing in 2022. So fingers crossed for to, that we make up the difference of 0 0.86 of a second. <laughs> Oh, Millie, amazing. Wow. I mean, I think you've encapsulated there what it is to rethink disability, you know, um, and, and to really focus on on achievement and the things that, you know, you want to achieve. It's just brilliant to hear how that paid off for you uh, in, in the last games. Um, I'm just a little bit interested there. You, there's, there's, uh, I mean, I kind of didn't realise this, but I didn't realise that the communication through you and your uh, ski partner happened through technology. It, mm. and and does that kind of technology help in in all different areas of your life and sport and and competing um tell us a bit more about that yeah so our headsets uh they're just bluetooth um so we've got a microphone and an earpiece that fit into our helmets um they're actually originally designed for motorcycle helmets um and oh. we've just sort of adapted them so that they fit into our ski helmets and uh that you know we rely on them very very heavily um because originally when I first started skiing we literally just used to shout to each other and there's very little information that you can um sort of access <laughs> with just shouting um and so now our bluetooth headsets are just amazing and sometimes we forget that we've taken them off <laughs> so yeah. we're kind of like whispering to each other <laughs> amazing absolutely amazing well thank you for sharing that with us and, and giving us an insight into how you know, you, you've supported yourself, but also that, that kind of that team spirit element of, of the sport that you do. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Millie. Nice. Um, so that, that is it that, that we've heard from our speakers and how wonderful. I mean, I think the couple of things strikes me about this amazing um, event. One is that legacy of the Paralympic and Olympic Games in 2012. I mean, look at, look at how, you know, Deborah, your story has inspired Millie and uh, Livy to be part of all of this. You know, it's just how wonderful that, that that event has kind of become part of our lives in different ways. Um, and, um, and, and I think now if I look over to the chat box, we've also started to get questions come through. So I think we had one uh, to start with. I just need to find it for, um, for Olivia to start with. Um, Okay, so Olivia, let's start with one for you that's come through. As a Team GB para athlete, you're an example of someone who's reshaping uh, the, the imagination of many when it comes to what people with disabilities can achieve. What advice would you give to people with disabilities who are watching? So, hello guys. People with disabilities, I would give them advice to always try anything that you get given offered the opportunity or, or given opportunity. Never always say yes to anything because you never know where it can take you. With me getting invited to that England talent day with the athletics, like that was the best thing ever. Like I wouldn't be a Paralympian if I'd done it gone or whatever. I don't know what I've been to this day, but yeah, do anything you can and never give up. Brilliant advice, love it. Mm -hmm. Millie, this one's for you. Um, having people who mirror um, our story can be a uh, great inspiration whilst growing up. Do you have any figures of inspiration? Um, that has had a similar that have had a similar effect on you is yeah. there anyone that you look up to um throughout my life it's always changed as i develop as an athlete um initially it would be older members of my team um who you know when i was just sort of a low level athlete um and um there were people like kelly gallagher um who at the time was um our, our greatest sort of skier um and I just thought, wow, you know, she's incredible. Um, and then as I've, as I've got older, um, it's, it's been people who sort of like my coaches. Um, I've, I've been really, really fortunate to have some incredible coaches um, who I always have this thing that if, if you work hard for me, I'll work even harder for you. Um, 
so when I've had a coach that's really um, embraced that, then, you know, all I want to do is, is work as hard as I can for my coach. Um, and that's always been a really nice drive. Um, also my mum, she, she's been the constant throughout my career. Um, and that, that one person who's always, always been there for me. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's inspiration that comes from various different avenues. Oh, thanks Millie. And where would we, any of us be without our mums, huh? Mm -hmm. Um, Deborah, there's one for you. Uh, so it says here, when it comes to challenging the status quo and rethinking disability, why is it taking longer than expected, I guess, to see the changes that we all want to want to push for? Uh, that is that is a question that probably has a lot of answers. Um, I think. I think change is difficult um, for people in general, as I, I, said, I said at the beginning, and I think that sometimes positive change is even harder to instigate. I would say, however, that I, I would go back to what I said at the beginning, which is one of the inspiring things that has come out of this very difficult time is our innate adaptability. Um, and I've seen organizations have to rethink themselves very quickly. I've watched, as we all have, incredible examples of innovation um and ingenuity come out of difficult situations and so i think whilst i don't think i can answer the question in its totality i do think that there's hope moving forward i think having the conversation going continually is a really important thing you know to keep talking to keep listening and frankly to keep on hearing inspiring stories like those of millie and, and livers Absolutely. Thank you for reminding us of that. I mean, you keep talking, keep the conversation alive. A bit like the flame, really, you know, <laughs> keep it going. Um, we've got a, a, a couple of similar questions, but uh, people out there are really interested in Livy and, and Millie um, hearing where you get your kind of resilience, your drive, you know, your, um, your strength to, to keep going. I think as athletes, um, there must be ups and downs. So tell us a bit about how you guys keep motivating yourselves. Um, um, Millie, I think you're you're already on. So why don't you start us off, and then we'll go to to Livy. Um, yes, that is something that I've very much struggled with, especially over the last sort of three years with the concussion. And um, you, you kind of sometimes you get into a place where it's like, why am I doing this? You know. But I think that is also um, a really important tool that I've learned. You know, to actually sometimes question why I'm doing this, and am I actually doing this for the right reasons? Um, and um, yeah, I, I think obviously I've got this this goal, this um, where I want to be, um, but lots of other people, like I, I've kind of just touched on, um, have helped me get to that point, and and I want to do it for those people that that have. So sometimes when when you do get those days where you are questioning what's going on, you've just got to think kind of a how far you've come in your your journey and in in your in your life. Um, and that you kind of don't get to this point when you get to this point. Um, you know, we, we've now done eight years um, and uh, we've got sort of two years left to the next, well, not quite 18 months to the next games. Um, so it's, it's kind of just realizing what you want. I love that. You don't get to this point to get to this point. I'm remembering that. Thanks, <laughs> Millie. Livy. Um, so I think for me, I've always got determination because obviously I've had to, to have to fight since I was a very young, like young kid with a cerebral palsy and everything. I've been bullied when I was at school as well and like getting called horrible names by my, my cerebral palsy and stuff, you know. It's disgusting, but like for me as a person, like I'm like, I want to prove people wrong. Like, look, look what I've done with my sport. Look what you've done kind of thing, you know. You're not a very nice person, you know, kind of thing. But um, yeah, I just think my, my personality, I'm very, I'm, known as a fighter and I'm very determined and I think my dad and my mum and dad they, they've got will they, they have a big impact on me because they're like living you can do it and I'm like yeah I know like they really believe in me and I think having that confidence and that self-belief as well is a big thing and just you know like done all the hard work you've got to be on that you're ready to be on that that you know that, that, line, that line or if you're ready to be on that runway you know kind of thing it's just having that self-belief kind of thing you just never give up and just know that you've, given, you've tried your best. 
Oh, so, yeah. So well, that's just amazing. Thank you. I don't, I don't know anyone who probably doesn't want to go outside and go for a run or something like that now <laughs> after hearing about it. Fantastic. Um, so I don't know if we have any more questions, but that, those are some, some pretty wonderful ones coming through. Um, I'm just checking with my colleagues. Um, but some wonderful comments of people um, on the chat, you know, really appreciating you guys sharing your time, your insight, the things that went on behind the scenes that some of us don't get to hear about, um, you know, particularly as we, I think it's such a, it's such a, a moment where we all come together when the Olympics and Paralympics are on and how, what a privilege to hear from Deborah kind of behind the scenes and the thinking that goes um, into the, the torture relay. And then Millie and Livy, just to hear from you guys as, you know, as athletes out there, um, I guess what I'm taking from it is that, you know, nothing comes easy and you guys inspire yourselves and your achievements are wonderful and amazing. And I'm sure that like me, everyone out there are going to follow your, um, your continued success and root for you um, next year and, and in time to come. So um, with that, I want to thank everyone who, who tuned in today to, to, um, to, to be part of this, this special event, Mark. And um, what would have been the Tokyo Games. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to our wonderful guest speakers, Deborah, Livy, Millie. It was absolutely wonderful to hear from you. Um, at Seeability, we're really pleased that we could bring you this virtual event, thanks to our panelists um, who've given their time so generously. Um, and as you know, as charities, uh, your support is needed now more than ever um, as we work you know, particularly as an organization like ours, we want to emerge from lockdown, ensuring that society really is inclusive. We've heard of some structural challenges out there in society that's meant that people have been even more affected by you know, COVID. Um, and we're working really hard for that not to continue to be the case. So we're all, we're, we're pushing really hard that as we emerge from, from the pandemic, particularly that we emerge into a society that is more inclusive and that creates opportunities for everyone to thrive. So as I said, if you're able to support us today, um, please visit our website. That's www.seeability.org forward slash donate. Um, and if you are able to leave us a gift, um, please quote Paralympic event, and then we'll be able to know um, uh, that, that, that your gift was given as a result of this event. Uh, I think we've posted the link in the chat as well, but it just leaves me to thank you so much for joining us and uh, hope to see you at our next In The Lounge event. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely to meet you guys. Thank you. Lovely. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.